like being Lee Murray, wanted to be world champion in the USC. He just happens to be involved in the largest cash robbery in the world. This is the sort of thing you see in Hollywood films. Heists, armed gang, huge amounts of money. The policeman, shorty, hoodie, Mr. Average, high vis, driver, and stopwatch. A fiendishly clever plan, which up to the moment they drove away had worked flawlessly. Catching Lightning, only on Showtime, streaming with Paramount Plus. All right, let's be honest. There's something that happens every couple of years. Uh, this guy, Pat Candelis, puts out a great documentary on Showtime, and I get all fired up to talk to him. So let's do that right now. Uh, Batbridge Entertainment's own, you may remember him from such classics as Disgraced in 2017 and Outcry, peak pandemic watching. But Pat, Catching Lightning is the new one. The Showtime Sports documentary that debuts Friday, April 7th. And we're talking about MMA. We're talking about bank heists. We're talking about everything that gets me fired the hell up. Great to chat with you again. Um, I mean, you got to be excited because this is an edgy, amazing piece of content in this four-part series that you're about to put out. No, I, I appreciate that. And it's great to talk with you again, Brian. Thank you for that very kind intro. This is a, a wild story that we've been working on for, I mean, more than three years. So, yeah, I am... Uh, extremely excited to finally be able to talk about Catching Lightning and uh, what we have in this documentary. Well, when I talked to you after Outcry, you said, I got another idea in the hopper here that I think your combat sports audience will enjoy. So when we're talking Lightning Lee Murray, we're, we're certainly talking about one of the great like what ifs in, in sort of the early rise of the UFC. He makes an appearance. He looks like the next big thing, something the company can can build around in, in the eventual expansion into Europe and the UK. But I don't know if this documentary is about MMA per se, even though you've got Chuck Liddell, you got Anderson Silva, you got all of these, these legends in here. Uh, the true crime element, when we're talking about one of the largest uh, heists, cash heights in history, I believe the equivalent, $92 million American was taken in this. So how did you come about entering the idea for this? Was it through Lee Murray's, you know, sort of, interesting character or was it through the idea that no one's really told the story of this incredible robbery let me be the the one to do it as in-depth as possible it was both of those actually i i stumbled across the story and i can't remember the, which article i ended up reading every article that had been written but i was surprised that i hadn't heard more about lee murray i i heard the name i did not certainly did not connect the name with the securitas heist in 2006 so i really didn't know anything about lee or about the robbery and learning more about Lee, um, he, he became, uh, he's clearly, unequivocally, the most fascinating character I've ever stumbled across or ever tried to cover. So when you compare a fascinating, unbelievably unique, mythical legend like Lee Murray is, especially in the UK, with the world's largest cash heist and all of the craziness that surrounds that, it's such an unbelievable story and it's been uh it's been a hell of a ride to, to try to tell it and bring it to audiences incredible I've, i have so many questions about the process but let's start on lee you know when you start to uncover who this guy was of course you know he's incarcerated now after after such a incredible heist and in, in sort of the things going on in his personal life outside of mma but when you sat down with the legends when you poked your head around you know ufc in terms of like how good was this guy what yeah. was sort of the reaction you kept coming across? I was shocked, actually, you know, because I knew he'd only done one UFC fight in his career. He didn't have very many professional fights. He had hundreds and hundreds of street fights, which have all kind of become legendary. But I was really surprised to talk to Anderson Silva, who was his last professional fight, to talk to Pat Militich, who he was training with in the very early 2000s when Militich's camp was Matt Hughes, Robbie Lawler, Jens Paul, or Jeremy Horn. Uh, Tim Sylvia, you know, uh, Tony Fricklin, like these amazing, amazing fighters. Everybody said the same thing. And, and Remco Pardell as well, like amazing uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner in Europe, uh, that, that Lee Murray was so good, that he was so talented, that he worked so hard, everybody thought he was going to be a champion, if, if not one of the goats. And I was surprised, like Remco says at one point, you know, I think he could have been the next Anderson Silver or Fader in our in our industry. 
I, I had him repeat that because I was so surprised <laughs> to hear him say that. But it was something Pat Miletic, I mean, I kept hearing over and over again, you know, so it was uh, it was amazing, you know, that he did have that kind of skill level. He did have that kind of talent. And uh, yeah, if, if only it had gone a different direction. Yeah, I mean, there's some allusions to the idea to to double down on that, that, you know, he may have been the first Conor McGregor before McGregor yeah. in terms of the idea of that overseas star who has really that it factor that just screams, I don't know, coolness, confidence, dangerous, you know, that's certainly there. When you're when you're a documentarian of which you're Emmy Emmy award winner. So we're talking about the highest level here. I mean, you're 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 part like investigative reporter. You're part a lot of things in some ways. You're part psychologist in putting this together and trying to tell these stories. When you look back at Lee Murray, the fighter, and I ask you, how did he become Lee Murray, the bank heister, and now this sort of infamous legend? How did that happen based on you, you know, going back and digging all this up? I mean, he is, he's a guy that is, uh, I, I really can't overstress enough to the audience, like his legend, especially in the UK, everybody there knows who Lee Murray is. He is a, a A-list celebrity in the UK. Uh, his exploits are, are beyond legendary. I mean, we were we were filming there, staying the whole crew staying in the hotel, and they found out what we were doing. And I mean, everybody working at the front desk literally knew him, right? And are, are making calls and saying, who are you? What are you doing? I mean, you couldn't <laughs> walk 10 feet in England without somebody knowing Lee Murray. So a guy like that, that has that kind of reputation, he has it for a reason. And he has it because he's a very, very dangerous individual when it comes to fighting. And he had so many street fights. He, you know, apparently would throw down at any time to help somebody. So what we were trying to do is, who is this person, right? Let's get beyond the myth. Let's get beyond the legend, the stories. Who is he? As a, a try to look at him as a three-dimensional human being. And that was really, really fascinating because we heard over and over again how nice of a guy he was, how generous he was with his time and his money, and that if anybody did need help, he would, he would give them the shirt off his back to do that. So combining that with the street fight element, with the obviously intimidation and danger factor with him, how skilled he is as a fighter, and then finding out that he you know, very much was a legit gangster. He was not a pretend MMA gangster. He was a very legit guy who wanted to leave that world and, and be known as an MMA champion. How much would you say that Lee's uh, inability to gain a visa and, and really capitalize on the momentum of that one UFC fight that opened up a lot of eyes ultimately led him to the path? We're, we're, we're setting a, a ground, we're setting the stage here that this guy was equally dangerous in and out of the cage, but yeah. When we're talking about compelling personalities, you nailed it. It's almost like a Robin Hood element at the same time yeah. of having a good side. How much did that stumble in, in the path he was trying to go down, do you think, led to ultimately to this Securitas 53 million pounds uh, cash removal? I mean, it's hard to say because he was still very much engaged in, in criminal activity. But I think, yeah, like there's a very specific turning point that I believe, you know, kind of changed the course of his life because he, he had an opportunity uh, he apparently was offered a three-fight contract in the UFC. He would have had a rematch with Tito, which would have been massive and, and an amazing fight to see. And because of this visa issue, for a, a very specific reason we get into in the documentary, that that all was basically ended. And yeah. so when that happens, he's absolutely going down a path that he probably was already on, right? Had he gotten those visas, the thing is he would have gotten off that path. Right. So it wasn't like he was necessarily on the straight and narrow and then got off because this happened. He was definitely, hey, you know, I think 24 <laughs> one says he had two feet solidly in the criminal world. Right. And was trying to get out of that to do professional fighting. And his, his dream was to become a UFC champion. So when that got dashed, I mean, I think I do think that was a fork in the road. But, I, I, you know, it's hard to say whether or not he would have been completely out of the criminal world, you know. That's, that's tough to say. Well, look, the the real, the real jewel of this documentary in this four-part series, especially if you're an MMA fan, is all of those stories retelling the legendary amount of street fights or near yeah. street fights or times that Lee Murray just acted the part of real-life gangster. One of those was the very well-known 
Tito Ortiz fight behind the scenes. You referenced the idea of eventually having them rematch in a real UFC fight. We got some great file footage from Tito in this doc, as well as real time rememberings from those who were there when a lot of, it's not just the Tito street fight. It's a lot of these crazy moments. I didn't even know about how hard was it to try to track down Tito? What was the response in that regard? Because I'm, I'm obviously it's not something he wants to relive second by second. Yeah. I mean, we, we found that out. I reached out to his manager and, uh, and, you know, spoke with him and said, I want to want to have this perspective included in here. And he said, it's going to be really tough to get him for this. And then he never responded. So clearly he didn't, he didn't want to talk about it, but it's kind of, I mean, I, I get it to a certain extent, you know, it's not, it's not like we want to like come out and just dog Tito to death here in the dock. It's not <laughs> the point, but it's, it's a moment that, be, that again, added to the, the legendary status of Lee Murray, that while Tito is the former light heavyweight champion. And at that time, the biggest star of the UFC that, you know, a guy that he always by something like, you know, close to 50 pounds, knocks him out in front of all of these other UFC fighters of this crazy, you know, fight that breaks out. So to have Pat Militich, Tony Fricklin, um, Lee's former trainer, Terry, and then, you know, Chuck Liddell, who was there as well, kind of give the minute by minute is amazing because it's, it's so detailed and you're, you're going to get a very clear sense of what actually happened when you watch that. Yeah, no, no question about that. All right. You said this is what you've been doing the past three years. The results are incredible. Take me to the process here. How much of your life gets consumed by that? I mean, maybe, maybe year one looks different from year three in terms of what you're doing day to day, but those that know you, do they know that if you got a project, don't, don't be calling Pat. He's not, you know, uncle Pat's not showing up. Be like, he's, he's in this thing. How deep do you get in this thing? Yeah, unfortunately, there's there's some truth to that. It, it becomes an obsession. And yeah, it, it's for the longest time. The hardest thing is you just can't really talk about what we're working. But yeah, this was a beast. This is a beast to tackle. I mean, the research started in 2018, um, really accelerated into 2019. And then, you know, our first interview, I think, was Pat Militich, and that was September of 2020. Right. So right as the country is essentially shut down, we actually had to drive from Texas to Iowa, you know, no flights were really going to do that. And then we had to wait to get into England with COVID and all the other countries. I think we shot in six countries in this documentary all during the COVID process. So this was quite unique. It was by far the most challenging project that I've ever done while simultaneously being the most fun to be able to talk with, you know, guys like Anderson Silva and Pat Militich and Chuck Liddell and Tony and Remco was so much fun and they're such nice guys so yeah i feel i feel very blessed to be able to tell the story um but it was certainly not easy when you come to the ending and you're you're just about at the finish line here ahead of this premiere it's gonna uh premiere on showtime's on-demand platforms and streaming as i mentioned friday april 7th get the official television premiere sunday april 9th 8 p.m eastern and pacific on showtime are you already on your next project mentally? Or is there is there a victory lap where Pat gets to go to the premiere and be like, man, we did it? I mean, the fact that we're having a premiere is kind of the victory lap, you know, because we haven't really had that. We had we had two projects in 2020 that came out, Outcry at Showtime, and another one at HBO called The Scheme. And that was, you know, they were both supposed to premiere at South by. COVID happened, so none of that happened. And then we had another project in between. So we've had three where we haven't really been able to take any kind of lap whatsoever. So it's really great that Showtime is having a premiere for this and we can celebrate a little bit, but yeah, there's, there's always has to be another project going, you know, so there, there is, there's, there's multiple things always in development um, because it takes so long. I mean, again, this is a well over three year process, so you, you can't wait till you're done. You're, you're never going to get a, you know another one going. So for sure. This is great though. I mean, I'm, it's, it's always the period between when we finish it to when it airs, that is the most anxious because it's like, it's done. You want it out. You want to see what the audience is going to, you know, the reaction to this is going to be, you want to be able to finally talk about it. So yeah, every day it, it, it gets a little bit better and better to finally be able to discuss it. We mentioned the the multiple sit downs you had with UFC legends, which really helped paint the picture of exactly who Lee Murray was in his role in this larger heist. Did you get any, any acceptance or pushback from the UFC in, in trying to reach out to them? That's a tough one to answer. Cause yeah, there's, there's a, 
you know, UFC and, and Showtime don't necessarily have the greatest relationship. Um, so it's also the idea, there's so many people that, that claim to have connections to the story. It's something that we really had to keep under wraps, right? I didn't want to, I wanted to be under the radar with this, only reach out when we absolutely had to about sure. what's going on. Because I think, you know, I've been told this is a, a story that many people have tried to tell multiple times. Um, I certainly know in talking to Lee's family, I mean, they showed me just dozens and dozens of, of people reaching out to try to do similar things. So this one was more kind of under the radar with all of that. And I mean, the, the fighters themselves, everybody said yes right away. But yeah, it, it, it was staunchly a, a Showtime production, if that makes sense. That does. It does make sense to me in that regard. Uh, what are the biggest pitfalls in, in trying to take a project like this to the finish line because you're going to have people that don't want to be interviewed so you know yeah. what uh, how do you get around some of these things it's, it's a really great question it, it changes for each project you know like there was there's one very specific person in this that we we tried and tried and tried to get to go on camera um, who just would not do it um but i i think that we were lucky in that we had cooperation from every other perspective right, which is always something that we're trying to do. I don't want to tell a one-sided story. We want to get everybody's perspective, tell, put every kind of piece of the puzzle there for the audience so they're seeing the most complete picture, you know, they've ever seen when it comes to the specific story. So having the, the police, right, that investigated this directly for years and years, having the prosecutor in England that tried the cases in England, the defense barristers, the actual hostages themselves that were Securitas employees, now we have Lee's family for the first time that have never, Lee's family and friends that have never talked before, agreed to sit down and talk. So, I mean, that that was fantastic to have so many different perspectives here. I think it really, really, um, I mean, it, we couldn't do the story without that. You know, that was, was the biggest challenge was getting everybody to say yes. And uh, we had a lot say yes right away, but there was, there was uh, some others that it took quite a while. <laughs> Uh, this is such a cool four part series, because if you're in it for the MMA side of it, you get a very interesting and detailed portrayal, like we mentioned, of who Lee Murray was, what he could have been and all of that. But the central event is that that heist from the Securitas right. Depot. Uh, I, I assume based on your level of research that you, you know, maybe not an expert on organized crime, but how how well executed in hindsight, would you say? I mean, they took 92 million American dollars out of that British bank depot. Uh, how would you classify that? I mean, it was like perfection, correct? It was. It was. It was flawless in the way they did it, which was one of the things that really interested me when we initially started looking into it. How does this happen? How does a place that the Brits describe as similar to Fort Knox, right? These guys get in and you're talking about like, there's such a Hollywood element to this. Right, you see it again, you know, like when you dig into it, you're like, how has this not been made into a movie yet? You know, you have prosthetic disguises, you have these guys walking in, you know, it's there's a very heat type, you know, feel to this and tone and what they were doing with the weapons, full body, you know, body armor in some cases, mass, right? But the, the extraordinary links that they go to in the months and months of surveillance and planning that they did is amazing. It's remarkable. I mean, even the police and the doc are like, we've never seen anything like this before. This is the kind of Mission Impossible stuff that happens in Hollywood. It doesn't really happen for real in real life. So this was such a unique case. It was really amazing to dig into that. Um, but you see in the documentary like this, there's a flip side to that coin, right? Where, where the robbery itself went off amazingly well. Um, and there's a lot to be said for that. Other things were not done well at all. You know, but it takes it takes a special kind of person to say, hey, I'm going to take all, you know, 15 plus people hostage, you know, and and, uh, and bring a seven and a half ton truck in and spend an hour and 20 minutes robbing a place. You know, again, we don't see things like this happen very often at all. No, no, not at this level. So this robbery is back in 2006. Mm -hmm. Is it safe to say that that was a turning point in some degrees in, in insecurity? And like, I mean, when 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 a when a local bank depot was hit that hard, what, what changes go into account after that? What did they, what do you think everyone learned from this incident? Well, in England, it's interesting, right? Cause they don't have guns, right? So it, it was fascinating to us as Americans looking at this and talking to the police going, you got 
more than, I mean, an American dollars was more than half a billion dollars in cash and one building, and there's not a single armed guard there. That seems completely ludicrous to me still to this day, right? But they have such a, a non-gun attitude. They're like, well, we have these security measures in place. You know, we, we just don't want to do that. So, I mean, essentially the first person that walks in with a handgun, they own the building, it's over, right? That's it, that's all it takes. So that really hasn't changed over there. You know, they, they definitely beefed up more uh, security in that location, but I mean, we had police say that there was an actual threat to the Bank of England, they felt like, because there was so much currency that was taken that was used to go back into the retail system, specifically in feeding ATMs, that they were afraid there was going to be kind of a bottleneck happen. So, I mean, this was, to say it was, this was a historic case over there is really, really kind of an understatement. And to our knowledge and the police that we interviewed, this is the largest cash robbery in world history. It's, it's, it's an incredible story. And to see it painstakingly broken down in such detail, the access you get to security footage, witness interviews, yeah. all of that, a incredibly compelling watch. Uh, this is going to be like asking your favorite child, but do you have a favorite piece you work on? Is it the one in the moment? Because this one's yeah. so good that I'm like, this might be the best Pat Candela's piece I've seen. It's well, thank you. Thank you. But no, it's the one in the moment. You're absolutely right. It's the one that you're doing now is, you know, that you're, you're completely obsessed with. And, and yeah, and this one though, again, I, I, I can say again, like this is the most fun, you know, the travel that we were able to do and to interview. And how do you get a story where you have a knighted prosecutor like Sir John Nutting? Right. And then interview him and Anderson Silva and Pat Militich and, you know, all of these people in the same documentary. I've never seen anything like that. And you when know? you come across a voice, was that Sir John who narrates the yeah. opening sequence? When you come across a voice like that, you got to be like, we need that in there. Right. Right. He's away. amazing. He's absolutely amazing. And that's, there was there's so many great people in this documentary, so many great characters. It was just a blast from from start to finish to do this. I, I wanted to catch up on Outcry in 2020 because we yeah. we all stopped in the middle of the pandemic and it was like the Michael Jordan Last Stand documentary and Outcry on Showtime that was all keeping us, you know, satiated, waiting for the, the sports world to open back up. That was, of course, about the exonerated uh, ex-high school football player Greg Kelly and the dramatic release from prison and just an incredible look at a at a at a man in 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 his in in his journey. How much have you been following the Kelly story after that fact? Because that, this is such like, such like an incredible young man who yeah. I feel like whatever he does in life will be incredible based on everything he's been through and who he is as a person. I'm not necessarily asking, are we getting outcry the sequel here, but uh, how much are you in touch with Greg these days in, in, in his family? A lot. In fact, he, we were texting yesterday. We're having lunch tomorrow. Um, so he's uh, we, we, we haven't seen each other that much in the last eight months, but we, we are in contact frequently and just watching what he's doing on social media. I mean, the business that he's created, you know, uh, he is he is a very, very smart person, a very intelligent person. And I think he's got a book coming out as well. I think that was the last thing I saw recently. So I'm curious to read the book and see see what else <laughs> is in there. But no, he's he's a fantastic guy. And um, I mean, that you couldn't ask for really a better ending to a pretty a pretty damn tragic story. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I wish him a lot of well. I know he's back in school. He played a little bit of college football, got to, yeah. you know, live some of his his dreams out and got married and all that. Uh, uh, definitely a, a young man I'm following closely and was really touched by that. So last time I talked to you, you said, hey, we got something brewing here that's going to be pretty great. You couldn't give me the details. Now I understand why. It, what's brewing in the in the Pack and Dallas coffee pot right now? Same thing, a project I'm uh, becoming obsessed with and really, really love, think is a fantastic story. Um, and we're we're working on it now. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. It's probably gonna be probably gonna be a couple of years, but we'll see. Uh, between Outcry, Disgraced, which of course is about the uh, the Baylor basketball scandal that went down and, and this new one catching lightning, you ever you ever catch a receipt in the aftermath? I mean, is there any ever any follow up like legal issues or threats or very unhappy people when you peel back the onion of a controversial topic? I have. Yes. Unfortunately, there has been we've gotten um, nasty emails and things of that nature. We, we've been told that certain parties and entities are not happy. So that's going to happen. But I mean, you know digging into some of these stories, again, if they're controversial, there's always going to be one party that 
that's upset about something. So yeah, it's, you know, we don't try to do that. I want to be clear about that. It's not like we're going out there saying, hey, let's let's see how many people we can upset or piss off here. <laughs> you know, we're trying to find something that's ultra controversial. Um, it's just we we just honestly backbridge my my amazing team. We get together and say, do we like the story? Do we want to work on it for the next few years? And are we going to be proud to put our names on it at the end? That's really the only criteria. So what is your 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 chief motivation when you go to put a project out there? Is it is it to uncover the truth? Is it to tell a great story and get interviewed by me? I mean, what is it, Pat? <laughs> it's yes, getting interviewed by you, Brian. Thank absolutely. You, thank you. That was the goal. So, yes, that's amazing. Um, no, I think it is to tell a great story. And, and while you're doing that, it's ultimately it's always to try to get to the truth. Right. And then, you know, if you if you start developing something and you're looking into it, I have questions internally. I just want to understand it. I want to know more about it. And that's what drives me personally moving forward with it. Right. Because like it just have these questions that I want. I want to get answered so I understand it better. So maybe it, you know. maybe you were a nosy kid, Pat, but it's working out for you. you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't think I was, but maybe you might be right. I mean, you might be right. I mean, I love doing this. There's nothing else I would I would ever really want to do. And all these stories. I mean, I, I can't think of any other job where I could get paid. You know, like I got paid to talk to Anderson Silva and Chuck Liddell. And, Not bad. You know, yeah, it could be a lot worse. Could be a lot worse. Uh, Batbridge Entertainment, your company, doing great work. I mean, what is the deal in Austin, Texas with the damn bats? I mean, what's going on here, Pat? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand it at all, okay? Yeah, there's there's something like three and a half million Mexican free-tailed bats that live under Congress Bridge that you can see almost year-round, you know, tourists come stand on the bridge and it takes something like 30, 35 minutes for all the bats to leave at night. So it's become this, it's become this thing become a thing yes there yeah. you go well, only in texas forever as they say uh friday april 7th and debut that's on showtime streaming platforms sunday april 9th on showtime television 8 p.m eastern and pacific it's catching lightning lightning lee murray and one of the most incredible heists in the history of organized crime i loved it i know our listeners will too uh pat to close here what do you hope people are saying on the way out after watching all four parts of this i mean i hope they enjoyed the story i hope they i hope they really enjoyed it that it was a crazy story um but i you know I, i'm also very very happy that we can bring forward some voices in the story that the audience has never heard from before to really tell it in a very very unique way so i'm very very excited about that um and i think yeah just bringing the story to everybody i think the people that are in UK that all know it. They think they know the story. They don't know the story. <laughs> We're going to learn a lot here. And for a lot of us Americans that had never heard of the Securitas Heist, I think they're in for a, a hell of a fantastic story. Indeed. Uh, wow. This is great. Good stuff there. Pat Candela, it's always a pleasure to chat with you. I'll see you in about three years when this next thing hits the, <laughs> hits the light of day. Right? Thank you so much, Brian. I appreciate all the support. The Lightning Lee Murray wanted to be world champion in the UFC. He just happens to be involved in the largest cash robbery in the world. This is the sort of thing you see in Hollywood films. Heists, armed gang, huge amounts of money. The policeman, shorty, hoodie, Mr. Average, high vis, driver, and stopwatch. A fiendishly clever plan, which up to the moment they drove away, had worked flawlessly. Catching lightning. Only on Showtime, streaming with Paramount+. Plus.